Welcome to New York Bio's Virtual Breakfast Series, a digital program started in 2020, bringing you fireside chats with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. This week, we feature Dr. Matt McCarthy, physician at Weill Cornell's Medical Center and renowned author of the book, Superbugs. Zoom is cooperating. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is Jennifer Hawks Bland, and I'm the CEO at New York Bio. We're thrilled you're here um, for what is a milestone that I never thought we would achieve. Um, just because I didn't think it would be necessary. Um, so this, a year ago, we started hosting a virtual breakfast series. Uh, Craig Lipset was our first guest. And we thought we were doing this for, you know, a few weeks, a couple of months, whatever, kind of just, you know, shifting to virtual, um, scrambling like everyone else has. Um, but it's turned out to be a really um, amazing way for us to connect um, the New York Biotech Life Sciences ecosystem with some amazing guests. Today is no exception. Um, we have Dr. Matt McCarthy from Wild Cornell, and he has also participated on our annual meeting on a panel, right, discussion that we had. And today we are thankful that Moses and Singer has sponsored our breakfast series for the next four weeks. Um, and we are very much looking forward to looking back and looking forward. Um, so with that, as always, I will give you your standard reminders and suggestions. If you have questions for Dr. McCarthy, uh, please put them in the Q&A box or in the chat and Derek and I will uh, get to them as we have our discussion. Um, otherwise, with that, I will turn it over to Derek to do a more appropriate introduction of Matt. All right, thanks. All right, Matt, good morning. It's great to have you here. Um, you know, reflecting back when we were organizing our annual meeting, the first thing we were going to talk about was uh, anti antimicrobial resistance. And uh, then we switched over to COVID. We, we had you on the panel and that was terrific. And now, you know, we basically, you know, have been doing this virtually for a year, which is incredible. So we're really happy to have you here. And we usually start with a bit of an origin story. And I don't know how many of our guests are familiar with uh, your books, but you know, we've read one called uh, The Real Doctor Will See You Shortly, which is just a fantastic walk through uh, your year in, in residency. And obviously one that's a little more appropriate for this is, uh, is Superbugs, where you talk about kind of the rise of a potential epidemic. So we've really got a great background with a lot of stuff to explore. Uh, and if you could kind of just give everybody a little bit of an intro and, you know, let them know a little bit about your background and kind of how you got to where you are now. Yeah, thank you for, for having me. So uh, you mentioned this book, Superbugs, that I had written. So I am a, a clinician at New York Presbyterian Hospital on the Upper East Side. And one of the things that I had been noticing over the first five years of my career is that we were running out of antibiotics. And that was leading me into this book I ended up writing about drug-resistant bacteria. And in the process of writing this book, what I discovered was that all of the focus was on new treatments. And we were overlooking the fact that diagnostics were equally important. And that we weren't really putting attention to the fact that we need to be able to detect these pathogens right. to be able to you know, uh, adequately treat people. And that theme would end up having uh, a recurrence with COVID. Um, mm -hmm. Where, you know, it was in 2019, that my book came out, and I spent the the year uh, going around talking about, hey, we really should pay attention to the fact that diagnostics are, are as, as important as, as therapeutics and, and as vaccines. And so um, I, I will get to that in a moment. I don't know if you want to do Q&A or you want me to just tell you about what the- oh, Keep going, keep going. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll roll with it. Okay, you butt in whenever you, whenever you want. Um, okay. so, so basically what happened was um, I got into infectious diseases during my first year of medical school at Harvard, when there was this flyer that was in the common area that was looking for people to go to Africa. And what they needed were people to study Ebola virus. And what was happening is that Ebola would strike a village, it would kill 300 people, and then it would disappear for uh, 10 years. And nobody knew where mm -hmm. it went. And there was this theory that it was living in fruit bats. And so I said, hey, I'll, I'm looking for an adventure. I'll go to Africa and chase bats and study Ebola. And so I started during my first year of, of medical school spending weekends at Tufts Veterinary School, learning how to trap animals, learning how to catch bats, shooting blow dart guns, all of this weird stuff <laughs> that had nothing to do with medical school. <laughs> but 
it got me to go over to Africa. And what I would do is I would go into these villages with a team of researchers. I would go to the chief of a really small village and I would bring whiskey. And I would, this is 2004. And I would say, I'm asking for your permission to catch the bats that fly over your farms. And the chief would look at me like I was crazy and then would have a sip of the whiskey and look at the people in the room and say, okay, that's fine. And so what I would do is I would spend the evening with a team watching the migratory feeding patterns of these fruit bats. And we would figure out where they were flying over uh, trees at a low enough level that we could potentially put up nets and catch them. Right. And these were, mm -hmm. they looked like volleyball nets, but they were specifically a special type of net that had very thin um, mesh that the sonar would not be detected by the bats. And so oh, right. I would go up and catch these bats and then I would stick a needle into their heart and take the blood out and send it to the United States uh, where my team and others figured out that fruit bats were harboring deadly viruses. And there was something unique about bats that allowed them to do that, which is that they're the only flying mammal and they've got this mm -hmm. uh, ability to get their immune system to calm down in the presence of deadly viruses like rabies mm -hmm. or like Nipah virus. And I spent the next 15 years thinking about that experience, writing about that. I wrote about in Slate in 2015 that the next deadly pandemic would likely come from a place where humans and bats were co-mingling and specifically mentioned um, uh, Chinese meat market. Mm -hmm. So while I was out promoting superbugs, we get this notice in very late December, early January, that there is now this new respiratory pathogen that's potentially associated with bats. And that all fit together very nicely from what I had been seeing in mm -hmm. the jungles and also what we were expecting. And then something interesting happened, which is as a frontline clinician, the month of January and February, I started mostly February, I started seeing lots and lots of patients coming into the emergency room with flu-like symptoms mm -hmm. who mm -hmm. were testing negative for influenza. And they were testing negative for every other viral pathogen that we had. And yeah. the challenge was we would just, you know, you'd be watch the news and you would say, well, we should probably test them for COVID. Mm -hmm. But as you know, looking back a, a, from a year ago, what we've learned on, on February 4th of 2020, the CDC created a COVID test and sent it to all 50 states and then said, oh, don't use it. Doesn't work. Give us a moment. We need to fix this. So for the entire month of February, I was seeing these patients who clearly had COVID. Yeah. And mm -hmm. I, would, I would call the Department of Health, which had a very small reservoir of COVID tests. And I would say, I'd like to test this patient for coronavirus. And they would say, has this patient been in Wuhan province in the last two weeks? Right. And I would literally be looking at a patient yeah. on my cell phone with above it on CNN, it would be showing coronavirus in Lombardy, Italy, or in, you know, right. outside of Wuhan. Yes. And I would say, are you watching the news? Because th we, this is going to be a big problem. We got to test right. Yeah. And they would say, well, if they don't have that exposure, we, we're not going to test them. So the month of February gets to be very concerning. But late February, I start looking at these sentinel reporting sites, which are places that look at influenza-like illness reporting. And what I'm seeing is that in Chicago, and this is on February, say, 26th, I see that there's a spike in Chicago of influenza-like illness that's not influenza. Right. And I remember I almost dropped my phone and I just said, I was in my kitchen. I just said, this is going to be a disaster. This is already in the United States. We're not testing for it. And then on March 1st, um, New York reported its first case. And I was scheduled to go on Squawk Box the next morning on CNBC mm -hmm. to talk about superbugs and COVID. And the thing that caught my attention was not that we had had our first case. That was expected. It was right. we had only done 32 tests in the entire state throughout the entire January and February. Yeah, and that's where. And if you watch that clip now, you can see I'm going in there to the on that show to tell people this is going to be a disaster. Mm -hmm. And I don't want to scare people, but you know, as I was in the hair and makeup, the producer of the show said, "What are you going to say on TV?" And I said, "Well, I'm going to say there's going to be a massive disruption to daily life in America." And he said, do you think they're going to cancel March Madness? 
And I said, the <laughs> basketball tournament? And he said, yeah. If you, and I said, we're not going to be allowed out of our houses in a couple of weeks. Like, definitely it will be canceled. And he said, if you say that March Madness will be canceled, this clip will go viral. And I said, I'm sure. Uh, but, you know, and so, when right. you see, yeah, so you see, I'm on the, on the show and the, the hosts are trying to offer some reassurance and they say, don't we have a long history of diagnostics and therapeutics and isn't this all going to be okay? And I said, I'm telling you, I just came from the emergency room at one of the busiest hospitals in New York. Yeah. We are seeing patients and we don't have the diagnostic tools at our, um, at our fingertips. And I said, there is going to be a massive disruption to daily life in America. And you can see everyone just goes silent. And it's like, is this, does this guy know what he's talking about? He seems to know what he's talking yeah. about. Uh, and, and then like he seems seven, to rather confidently be telling us yeah, it's not okay. <laughs> and then seven minutes into it, you hear me just randomly go, oh, and by the way, March Madness is going to be canceled. <laughs> and and uh, so the, the clip does go viral. Um, when I got off of the, the sound stage, I had phone calls from four people waiting for me. One was from Jamie Dimon from JP Morgan. Mm -hmm. One was from the Secretary of the United States Army asking me to come down to the Pentagon to tell, talk to them. And one was from a Republican congressman and one was from a Democrat congressman. And they all had the oh, same goodness. message. Yeah, they all had the same message, which was, you seem to be know what you're talking about. And what you're saying <laughs> is very different than what we are hearing. Yeah. Um, and we just want to know what's actually going on. Um, and that was, you know, nobody was denied. They just were, wanted to know what the deal was. You know, I, yeah. I was yeah. very quickly on the phone with the, the, the army, with a group of people in military attire, you know, at the Pentagon, you know, answering questions about whether or not they should be doing joint exercises with South Korea and just sort of all kinds of logistic planning. Yeah. Um, but what I found was that there, while there were a lot of people who were supportive of what I had to say, there were a lot of people who were very upset with what I had mm -hmm. to say. Yeah. And if you go back and look, de Blasio um, later that day tweeted out um, that he encouraged New Yorkers to continue on with their normal lives. He recommended some Broadway shows and some movies and said, you know, basically said, this is, keep calm and carry on. Um, yeah. and, and, and we saw that a lot of these types of comments came out from people who were just like, just, it, it's gonna be okay. And, yeah. and what, happened was, uh, you know, I got a message very clearly that my point of view was not one that I should be continuing to share publicly. Um, and that was an interesting situation to be in because I yeah. felt like it was important to get the word out. Um, mm -hmm. But I also respected the, the, the people who were saying that, you know, just you got your message out now go back to work. Yep. And, and so what happened was um, a week later, I was uh, designated as the first coronavirus hospitalist at New York Presbyterian. So the idea was that we knew patients were going to be coming into the hospital. We wanted to have, once they're admitted to the hospital, a yeah. dedicated doctor to treat them, to try to limit the number of healthcare workers or doctors exposed to this yeah. virus. And so on yeah. Mar March 9th, 2020, um, I became the first COVID doctor and I had a physician's assistant with me. And just to give you a sense of what that day was like, um, we met in this very office. Um, we sat down together and watched a video uh, that had been prepared for us on how to wear PPE properly, uh, wearing the double masks and the gown yep. and the gloves. And there was a, a sign-in sheet outside of the patient's room that we had to check off that we were putting on the PPE properly. Um, and it was a, a tricky situation because we didn't know what drugs to use. And this is going to come up when we talk about looking to the future. Yeah. Um, yeah. You know, the, the whole training of, of, that I had been through was evidence-based medicine. You know, randomized, double-blind, placebo-controlled trials. Here's why you give aspirin for heart disease. Mm -hmm. yeah. We didn't have that. The, this was too new. All we knew was what looked good in a test tube. And we didn't have time to develop new drugs that, you know, de novo and put them through phase one, two, and three studies, we had to repurpose drugs. And so yep. the, the initial one that we could repurpose was hydroxychloroquine. Um, and so that's what I treated people with, you know, on March 9th and for several weeks thereafter. And some of the, uh, what I want to go through is sort of put you in my shoes um, back in March, because I think it illustrates kind of where things went from there. I yeah. can just, 
I could just talk for the next six hours. So I'm going to periodically <laughs> stop and ask if there are questions because yeah. I don't want people to have to wait till the end before I jump into what the it thing, was like going to. The thing that I think of too is, is you've, you know, you rewound to February before, you know, I mean, March maybe was the first case, but you know, you were talking about this stuff in February and just to give us a sense. So what do you do when you, when you see something where you don't know what it is, you don't know what it is. You can't really test for it. And, you know, do we actually have ways, I, I imagine we, we probably have better ways of doing this now, but you see it in Chicago. We, we, I imagine you saw stuff in, in San Francisco, right? Is there a way to basically have this level of communication around, Hey, we're seeing a bunch of stuff, you know, here, we actually see it may have popped up in Chicago. Is there any way for, you know, our, our professionals to kind of, you know, communicate with each other and let each other know what they're seeing. So it doesn't sound like there's a good structural way to do that. Well, people were chatting about it, but there wasn't a formal mm -hmm. structure. Yeah. One of the big lessons to learn here is that in a public health emergency, there was a longstanding policy that independent laboratories could not design their own test. You don't want some guy in Wyoming saying, I just created a test and everyone's positive and there's an outbreak in Wyoming when that's nonsense. Right. But what we have, could have done and what we will do in the future is when you see that the CDC had made a faulty test, you could leverage reliable academic laboratories and yeah. private laboratories to yep. make their own tests. Cornell could have made a coronavirus test in three days or a week. Mm -hmm. So could Columbia and Harvard and UCSF and every other, and, yep. and, and we ended up making our own test eventually. But for the month of February, we were hamstrung and we couldn't do that. So I think one of the clear lessons here is to identify a network of both diagnostic laboratories, but also, and I'll get to this later, clinical investigators who you can reach out to and just get things going quickly. Because I think one yeah. of the lessons is we were all caught flat footed here, not being ready to, to jump into action. And the state, at that point, the state lab was sitting on the CDC faulty test, right? Just because they were told to you have it and wait. And didn't Wadsworth, uh, Wadsworth ended up developing some of their own tests as well. Oh yeah, I mean, our, these laboratories are outstanding and they could yeah. have done this very quickly and we just should have given them the flexibility. I agree with the idea you don't want every person in the country coming up with a test. We <laughs> saw the limitations of that with the, the serology, the antibody test. But yes. for the PCR at first, we could have done that. Yeah. 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 So, so on day one, when we go to see the first uh, COVID patient, you know, what, what struck me was we didn't really know what drugs to use. And the first patient I saw, one of the fascinating things was that the looking at the patient's vital signs, the patient was incredibly hypoxic. So, so low that the, it looked almost incompatible with life, that the oxygen levels was so low. And then you walk in the room, the patient has uh, oxygen on and they're like, Hey doc, what's up? And I said, are you okay? Are you okay? <laughs> and I said, yeah, what, what, why? And I said, because the, the numbers don't look- Because uh, this machine says you shouldn't be functioning. Yeah, and, and that ended up being a classic uh, finding with coronavirus, which is called silent hypoxia, where people could have very, very low oxygen levels and not feel a thing. Right. Um, and when you, you know, if you remember when President Trump said that he uh, had COVID and then suddenly people are whisking him away to Walter Reed and he actually felt fine, when I heard that, I didn't think he was trying to be, you know, brush it off. I, th I thought that's actually pretty classic. That we often see people. Who, yeah. And that made it very tricky for people who got diagnosed with COVID, you know, in subsequent months, you know, you wouldn't believe how many people have texted me and said, hey, I just got diagnosed with COVID. I feel fine. Is there anything I need to do? I'm just supposed to quarantine. And in the back of my mind, I'm often thinking about, well, things could go badly and you wouldn't feel it. Right. And that's not yeah. the message that you want to send to people. And right. so then the, right. the, the next question is, well, do you tell every person to get an oximeter? Well, probably if you're 25 years old, you don't really need one. But, you know, in the course of all the stuff I'm doing, uh, it becomes a very complicated issue um, for messaging. And, you know, while it's one of 300 questions I'll answer that day, it's the most important question for that person. Yeah. And so it ended up being a lot of me thinking about the somewhat scary stuff I was seeing and trying to translate that into something that could be reassuring. Yeah. Um, right. And one of the lessons I learned, and you know, after I made that comment on TV that things were gonna go badly, 
I had offers from NBC News and Fox News to become their COVID correspondent um, mm -hmm. because I was saying something against the grain that proved to be true. Mm -hmm. But what I later saw was a lot of other doctors going on TV and trying to say how bad things were going to be and scary. Um, and I actually went in the other direction, which was I felt like my role was now since I had established that if I was going to say things are bad when they're really bad, I can actually talk about when things are improving and have some credibility. Right. Yeah. So you know, I've thought a lot about the messaging during this, but I'll, I'll hold off on that for, I think, a little bit later. But well, yeah, go ahead. I was just saying, so we, we were a family that bought extra thermometers when we could find them. We bought pulse ox, you know, and like, and because we were all so unsure about what data we were supposed to be looking for in ourselves mm -hmm. and our family members, you know, we were like, okay, kid, let's test, you know, and of course I wear nail polish and it doesn't work as well. And I'm oh, like, yeah. oh, I'm dying. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's the other part is that, you know, the, the, if the connection's not good, you could have a number that looks really scary and that could, you know, lead you to the emergency room. I just like, it, can, yeah. it can spiral very quickly. Um, well, it, so also seemed, it also seemed like there was no, there wasn't a, ton, a lot of consistency, right? I think the, the symptoms presented you know, you could have a bunch of different system symptoms and they could all, you know, things could all go south, but sometimes there was a fever, sometimes there wasn't. Sometimes, you know, you it's it's kind of like this mixed bag of sequelae where you can't just say, if you see this, then, right? Because you just had this wide variety of things. So, but like you said, the messaging is really hard because there wasn't one easy, consistent message that everyone could digest and follow these simple steps. And part of that is that the science changed. Right. Yeah. You know, it's going to evolve and the messaging will evolve. And some people don't mm -hmm. like that reality, but that's true. Um, so one of the other things. So I, I was saying that, I, you know, the first COVID doctor, we're hoping to shield others. By the end of that first day, it became clear we needed a second COVID doctor and a third. And within mm -hmm. a week, we had started talking about rearranging the entire hospital. And by two weeks later, we had turned essentially this hospital from um, a, a place with one COVID doctor to the hospital being a giant COVID unit. Yeah. Where and this is like mid-March, right? Late, I say mid to late March. I mean, it happens yeah. very quickly. And we were having multiple conference calls every single day, you know, talking about, do we turn the 11th floor into this? And how do we, you know, it was all just these incredible, yeah. I mean, it, and you, you know, when you think about like the heroes of the, the pandemic and stuff like that, the, the unsung heroes, are really the people who looked at like the staffing issues or things like how are we going to make sure that there are enough nurses to, to, to yeah. take care of these patients and uh, you know my boss says that one of his big lessons is that when you see a fire like this you want everyone to run in that's your instinct but that's actually not the right instinct that you need to have hold people back in waves um, yeah. to protect them um, right so that, the first issue was the question about what drugs to use and this issue. The, and then I was leading into the fact that the hypoxia. The other part with that was we often didn't know who needed to be on a ventilator because I would be looking at somebody and say, you look like you need to be on a ventilator. And they're like, me? Really? Uh, and so we ended up, some people got vent on ventilators that we now know didn't need to be um, simply because we just didn't know. The other issue yep. that started seeing very quickly is that patients were coming in with high, we had a high suspicion of blood clots, that they would have a very elevated test called a D-dimer, which is re representative of a blood clot. And then we would go hunting for the clots and we couldn't find them. We do ultrasounds of the legs, CAT scans of the chest, and we would be then say, okay, seems like they have a clot. We can't find it. Do we give a blood thinner? The side effect of a blood thinner is you could cause a dangerous bleed. You don't want to give them to somebody who doesn't need it. Yep. Yeah. But you also don't want to miss something. And, you know, is it possible there are tons of tiny little clots we can't see? And that's why they're having trouble breathing. And so one of the questions early on was, do we give these? And we're still researching this question. It's one of the things the NIH has invested heavily in is just figuring out what dose of blood thinner do we give people? Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. the, the third big question that we had early on was whether or not to give steroids. So I can remember in mid to late March, seeing, you know, I would be rounding with my team of medical students and residents, and there was a third year resident, a very senior person who's about to be an independent doctor who said, we should be giving these patients steroids, um, looking at their CAT scans of their lungs, it's just so much inflammation there. Mm -hmm. And I said, well, you know, the, there's a recommendation not to do it based on 
extrapolating from other coronaviruses, from uh, the original SARS and from MERS, mm -hmm. the Middle Eastern respiratory virus, that if you give steroids, it can increase viral shedding. It can make things worse. Okay. And so the question was, how do you make an informed decision about something like steroids when there's no randomized data? You could right. just start, you know, and so what I said to the team was, we could do this, but we need to have a conversation with the patient about yeah. this. And the tricky part right. is that many of the patients we were seeing didn't speak English. The hospitals in Queens and Brooklyn were getting overwhelmed and the Bronx, and they were referring patients to us. Yeah. And so as an ethical dilemma, I said to my team, how do you feel uh, talking about the risks and benefits of giving steroids for a brand new virus to a person who English is their second language and they have an 11th grade education? Yeah, um, right. And so what I did was I said, okay, if you can find another expert in the hospital, another attending physician who thinks giving steroids for this patient is a good idea, then I'll do it. And one way to look at that is to say, well, that's sort of liability sharing, but I wasn't worried about liability. I just wanted to get some other opinions. Yeah. And yeah. in general, people were very hesitant to give steroids. And it wasn't until the summer with a big study called Solidarity that we found out that we should have been giving steroids, that dexamethasone, a steroid, is now the only drug we have that saves lives for patients with COVID. And there were patients who probably almost certainly died in my care because we weren't giving steroids. Um, yep. That's one of the things that haunts me today is thinking yeah. back on what would there or could there have been a faster way to generate reliable, reproducible knowledge that we yeah. could use uh, to make these kinds of decisions. Because I saw yeah. many, many, many people die during March and April um, that, that probably didn't need to, frankly. Yeah. Um, I mean, there's there's so much of this that just shines a spotlight on the fact of you know of how important you know data is or reliable data, right? Because you go back to that decision and you're making a decision to the best of your ability on how similar viruses have behaved in the past, and you know it's a real risk of doing it, even though you think that the steroids are going to do what you want them to do from an inflammatory perspective, and you know all of this, whether it's you know whether it's the diagnostic testing, whether it's looking at you know whether it's, it's recording of the symptoms, whether it's anything like this, all of it means if we had a better informational infrastructure, we could have made a lot better, we could have made a lot of better decisions much, much earlier. Yeah, I mean, one of the things we see with, with South Korea is they, they had the, their first case on the same day as the United States, yeah. and they did a really nice job with messaging and with sharing information. And one of the reasons for that is they had a dress rehearsal for this in 2015 with Middle Eastern Respiratory yeah. Syndrome, and they had a coronavirus yeah. that everyone sort of was, you know, much more prepared than, yeah. say, we were. Um, as we looked at how things were evolving, one of the things that also struck me um, in late March, for just, you know, going through the timeline, is that I, uh, you know, the moment I walk in the hospital, I had to put on a mask. And that's because the whole hospital had COVID and it was, could be everywhere. And then I would step out yep. of the hospital and there was, nobody was wearing a mask. Yeah or you know, once a couple of people here and there. And that really bothered me and that really concerned me. And I did something that um, my wife and I have talked a lot about, but I, I was very active on Twitter at this time. Mm -hmm. And on March 28th, I tweeted out that the CDC was going to change its policy and recommend masks for the general public within 10 days. And that got a lot of attention that went viral and had 50,000 mm -hmm. people commenting on it. And what happened was I wasn't allowed to um, elaborate on this. And so what happened was oh, right. uh, that tweet got played on um, uh, MSNBC and Fox Business and uh, lots of places. And they started asking doctors, what do you think about this? And consistently doctors said, yeah, that's probably a good idea. They probably should revisit it. And then the following day, on the two days later on um, Face the Nation, they asked Scott Gottlieb, the former FDA commissioner, and he said, yeah, yeah I think they should do it. Um, and then you see the next day, March 30th, Fauci said the CDC was going to look at it. And then this momentum starts building. And then on April 3rd, we re the CDC changed its policy and recommended masks for the general public. I think that's a really important point that it was, yeah. we had all of February and March with this virus just ripping through the community with no masks. Yep. And, and, you know, I, I'm, I get interviewed for books now about people writing a history of COVID. Yep. And I saw, uh, I was reading something and a, a 
particular decision maker, a, a politician was being criticized. And it was on April 1st that this scene was happening and it said, and he wasn't wearing mm -hmm. a mask. And I said, well, on April 1st, there was no recommendation to wear a mask. You can't criticize the person for that. But right. that, that tremendous flip-flop is one that allowed people to say, whenever they hear something about COVID that they don't like, they can say, I don't have to listen to this. They were totally wrong for the yeah. most critical part of the, and I actually have sympathy for how people, you know, if your business has been shuttered because of COVID restrictions uh, and you're looking for a way out or you want some counterpoint, you can always point to that March or that, that April 3rd flip-flop. Um, yeah. It was right around this time that, uh, that we also started to hear that there was this new drug that might work called remdesivir. And mm -hmm. that was around the time Dr. Fauci said that this was gonna become the new standard of care. And that was a really tricky thing for us to hear because we hadn't seen the data yet and patients started asking for it and the drug wasn't really available. And so we got put yep. in this kind of bind where it was patients, you know, said, well, this guy says it's gonna work and, and we, we just didn't really know. Um, and eventually we got to use it. And I think there's been a lot written and talked about with remdesivir, but uh, it looks like it shortens duration of hospitalization, doesn't save lives. Um, but it's, uh, mm -hmm. you know, the antiviral that we're using now, and hopefully we'll have uh, more drugs to add to the cocktail. But for right now, you know, the, the drugs we're using today, that I'm treating a COVID patient this morning, uh, are the same drugs that I was using six to eight months ago, which are dexamethasone and remdesivir if your oxygen saturation is below 94% on room air. Um, and yeah. I'll, I, I'm running a clinical trial now. Uh, through the National Institute of Health that's looking for uh, better treatment. I, I guess I'll just, I'll mention that now. Yeah. So sure. after, after we saw the success of dexamethasone, that there was an anti-inflammatory that would help, uh, the NIH got the top scientists together and said, well, if, if inflammation is the problem, if what's really happening to people is they get the virus in their system, and then most people just get rid of it, but a subset of people uh, get sick, the people who are getting sick, it's not from the virus, it's from the immune system's response to the virus. And so right. could we somehow come up with uh, additional anti-inflammatories? And so the NIH launched a study called ACTIV-1, A-C-T-I-V-1, um, which I mm -hmm. lead at my institution, and it's being done at 60 different hospitals around the world. And what we do is, in addition to the standard treatments, we offer patients one of three different immunomodulators a batacept, infliximab, which are arthritis and colitis drugs, or this mm -hmm. experimental drug called Senec Riverock, which is a, an HIV drug, not even approved for HIV, but it was developed for that. Okay. Mm -hmm. And so the idea is we are looking for ways to drive down inflammation in the lung. And when I have this conversation with people, and which I do every single day, I've enrolled 47 people in this study, um, is they usually say, Okay, an arthritis drug, that makes sense. A colitis drug, okay. But an HIV drug? And I say, well, it's not, we're not using it for its HIV properties. We're using it because it decreases certain types of inflammation in the lungs. And that sometimes turns people off, frankly. Uh, but we, it's a, a large network of, of, of people who are studying it. And the thing that I think is kind of painful to think about is that that study launched in October. October 16th, the announcement was made. And that was mm -hmm. seven months into our, yeah. uh, you know, the pandemic, seven and a half months. And why did it take so long to identify the, you know, network of investigators? Um, it, there was even more delays for other types of red tape, uh, you know, but to see where things are at after active one, they saw the success of that. There was active two, three, four, five. And then yesterday they announced active six. Um, which is for outpatients, where we're trying to repurpose drugs for people who don't need to be hospitalized, right. Um, right. which is great. But it's, and I'm a, on the advisory committee for, for that study. Um, but what, what it's an acknowledgement of is that COVID isn't going away, that we are yeah. going to be investing in this for a while. Um, yeah. So I'm going to pause there for a second because I think that sort of takes us through the initial wave of March and April and just see if anyone has any questions. Well, we've actually, we've gotten a question from the audience that I think kind of sets us up for a bit of a transition. And we've, we've, you've talked a little bit about, you know, the question is, what have we learned that informs us about what we should do differently in the future? And the other question was, how much of this was known a year ago and ignored? And, and 
you know, ignored is a difficult word there, but you've actually hit on a lot of these things where the messaging is genuinely difficult, right? Your, your messaging is the best you can do at the time. And you don't know if, you know, what you're telling people is something that's you know, going to be okay and gone in a month, or you certainly don't know if it's something that's going to persist for a long time. So I guess the, the big question here is, you know, what are some of the things that we should absolutely do differently in the future, right? Not knowing, you know, when, if you rewind to kind of when you, you were on the phone and you saw the spike in Chicago, right? What are the things that we should have in place to do differently when you see that? Yeah, well, you know, one of the things to think about is we had a system in place called PREDICT that was monitoring viruses um, in mm -hmm. Southeast Asia that was looking at, at, at where there was this leak from animal to man. And we closed that program down in October. And when we did that, I tweeted out, this is a mistake. The next pandemic is gonna come from a virus that leaked mm -hmm. from animal yeah. to man. Anyone who was in this world of virology and looking at emerging infectious diseases yeah. knew that it was important to keep an eye on this stuff. The, the question is, how important is it? Is it worth billions of dollars? Is it worth hundreds of millions of dollars? I think a key to answering that question is to find out the ultimate origins of coronavirus. Yeah. When, you know, and this remains incredibly controversial. You know, I loved the bat story because it fit in with my own personal experience and it was just a very nice um, explanation of what was going on. When I started doing lectures about COVID, um, I initially said the chance that this was a lab accident was like 5%. I just didn't really think that's what it was. Um, yeah. And as I've looked deeper into this, um, that number has certainly gone up. Um, I, the other day, put it at 20%, 30%. It's creeping up. Um, the, the issue is that we don't know. There's a number of holes in the bat meat market story that have not been filled in yet. And if this ends up being from a lab accident, not that it was, but I think a lot more money is gonna be shifted in a way for, to prevent the future pandemics versus, uh, so, you know, in terms of global security versus do we just need to keep monitoring all the bats? If it ends up being a bat origin story where it was just a meat market, we need to close down every, you know, wet market in China kind of question. Yes. I think until we really get that answer, we can't figure out where we should put our resources. But you know, I think everyone's gonna be so traumatized by what we've been through for the last year and a half that there will be lots of money pouring into preventing the next one from happening. Um, yeah, in terms right. of was this known? Uh, you know, I was somebody who was writing and thinking about this. And if you asked me if I thought 500,000 Americans were gonna die uh, in 2020 from a respiratory pathogen, I would have said no. Uh, there was no way anyone was predicting this scale um, or the fact that, you know, in where are we now, April 20th, that we're having 70,000 new cases a day. Um, and th just the way that this is lingering was unpredictable, even from the very beginning. Uh, yep. So I think that there has been a lot, which I've already discussed about the need to identify reliable researchers to tap into very quickly to generate data. I think there's also been a revolution in how we're processing data and information. You know, it used to be you submit a paper to a, a journal and then there's peer review and it's all this like slow process. And now people are just uploading their data to yeah. these servers that aren't peer reviewed. Yep. Yeah. And, and then there was an even further step recently where the New York Times was interviewing people uh, about research that hadn't even been uploaded yet. And so you're, and you know, and, like. and we're talking about- The, the pre-preprint. Yes, yes, yes. And, and I think that, that that sometimes can be helpful, but other times not helpful. Uh, well, it's and also we, passed yeah. through the lens of, a, of someone else, right? It's not literally just that scientist, it's through the reporter and through, you know, so it's, it, it, it can take on different, it, the information can change. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Um, you know, I saw a couple of questions about when we will find out where this came from. Um, I think a lot of us were troubled by the WHO yeah. investigation, which largely was, you know, we, we asked the Chinese if it came from a lab and they assured us it didn't. Um, that's not the, the level of investigation I'd like to see. Um, so I think it's just gonna take a real independent uh, investigation where people are given the power to really chase all of the leads. Yeah. Um, 
And the question about whether or not the, the next pandemic is likely to come from, uh, from bats, you know, if in the beginning of the talk, what I mentioned was that they have a unique property, which is that they can suppress their immune system. And so that when they see Ebola or rabies, their body doesn't go into overdrive trying to destroy the virus, they coexist with it. And you can see, based on what I was talking about with humans, the ones who get in trouble, it's that they're, they try to destroy the virus and they get all ramped up and get overactive. And so bats do represent a specifically concerning reservoir. There are other animal reservoirs that could potentially uh, be implicated, in, um, but I would put bats at the top of the list for this one mm -hmm. um, in terms of where things are going. Um, so, I'll, so, you know, I, I think I've mentioned sort of the, the challenges with the diagnostics and the therapeutics so far. That brings us then to the summer, which was really, I think, a nice reprieve for a lot of the country where cases went down because so many people were outside. Yeah. Um, and it was in late August for me that things changed where um, the NIH said, are you interested in running this COVID study? And I said, you know, I haven't seen a case of COVID in a month. I don't know that we're going to have the numbers. And they said, well, why don't you sleep on it? And think about it. <laughs> and a couple of days later, I saw my first COVID case in weeks. And it was mm -hmm. a, a rabbi uh, who hadn't been wearing a mask at his congregation. Yeah. And he kind of joked with me that I was the guy who was making him wear a mask whenever I came in the room. And I said, were other people in your congregation wearing a mask? And he said, no, nobody wears them. We've all, we've all probably had the virus. And I said, oh boy, <laughs> yeah. this is not gonna be good. And so I called the NIH back and said, I, I will do that study. And what we saw very clearly was this escalation in cases that, you know, yeah. that was a disaster. And, and right around the time I saw that case, there was another thing that really was concerning, which was, the whole issue of convalescent plasma. You know, we had been studying that yeah. for a while. And then yeah. to have the head of the FDA come out and he said, you know, we have this massive breakthrough, 35% reduction in mortality. And every doctor on the front lines who's been studying this stuff knew that wasn't true. And it was a real, just, it was one of those, it was, okay, you know, I have two children. It's like if one of them had done something that disappointed me, where I just was like, you know, it's unfortunate that he said something that's just blatantly false and no one's going to believe. Yeah. And, you know, I support the FDA. They do great work. So I just kind of was like, that's a bummer. Um, and then they yeah. walked it back, thankfully. But that sort of shook our faith that this really important agency that was making decisions was saying things that, that seemed to have a, a, a leaning to it that was not, not objective. Um, and then as cases continued to go up, you know, it was, it was a really difficult time again. And many of us, I don't want to say depressed, but burnt, you know, we were burnt out. It was really yeah. hard. It was really exciting during the first wave. I can tell you, um, I was getting up at two or three every morning and taking the first train into the city. Um, and I was just like, I'd never felt more engaged with being a clinician. And it was exciting. It was difficult. It was fascinating that the landscape was changing every few hours, it seemed like. Um, but then when the cases came back the second time, that was when it was just so deflating. Yeah. And, yeah. and I can remember we did a, a, a survey among the clinicians I work with. And um, it was a high level of burnout. It was off the charts levels of job satisfaction. People just felt value. People actually listened to me when I say stuff, which was nice. Um, but it was also <laughs> just devastating to realize we were in for it again. And yeah. that one of the things we did was we created a sort of a buddy system where we were paired off with people to check in with each other to see how you're doing. Um, and it was really hard, you know, the, the, the part of what it meant for families and what people were going through at home. My own reaction to this was to have very minimal uh, restrictions at home. You know, I was not insisting on my kids wearing masks when we were just standing in the backyard and if yeah. they were, you know, trying to keep things as normal as, as possible. Um, so, and, yeah, go ahead. I was going to say, this is, this is something that I, I think and hope continues, but I think one of the things that we've seen in a lot of ways is almost an increase in the amount of I would say just just outward empathy for either people you work with or people you meet through business or just in general, 
kind of a little bit more of a concern for what other people may be going through, you know, for the, for however long the, you know, the first, you know, the first, however many minutes of a, of a conference call were usually, how's everybody doing? Yeah. And, you know, I, I think it would be, especially from a mental health perspective, I think it's, it's hopeful that something like that persists. Yeah. For right? me, a level of, yeah, yeah I ahead. agree. I would see these videos online where, you know, somebody's in a, a Starbucks not wearing a mask and they're screaming at each other. And I honestly, my reaction was both of these people are going through hell right now. Like this yep. video is not helpful for anybody. Like yep. the person who's acting badly probably has something very bad going on in their own lives. And so you're right, the empathy definitely uh, increased because of that. I, I saw one of the questions in the chat that I, I think is a really interesting one, which is about influenza. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So I have not seen a case of influenza in over a year, which is absolutely insane. Um, I, you know, infectious disease doctor and I'm a hospitalist, I treat dozens, if not hundreds of cases every year. And so the question is, what happened? And the, right. the, and the reason this is, you know, and I think the, <laughs> the obvious thing to think of is it's all of these NPIs, non-pharmaceutical in interventions. So wearing a mask, social distancing, closing down schools. And what is going to happen is cases are going to drop. So months ago, uh, I was asked by companies will ask me, they're like, when should we have people come back to work? When do we get back to normal life? I started working with a lot mm -hmm. of different firms and museums and all kinds of people yeah. just trying to give them straight answers for what's happening. And what I said was, I think that it's gonna feel like normal life again in September. And the reason I picked that time was I said, over the summer cases are gonna drop in the Northeast where a lot of the companies are that I work with. And they're going to you know, be kind of nice in July and August. And then we're all going to go back to work. We're going to go back to school, go back to stuff. And we have to make this decision. Are we going to wear masks? Yeah. Uh, mm -hmm. And I think for a lot of people, the answer is going to be no. And the, the push is going to be that you need to wear a mask, not because of COVID, but actually because of influenza. And, you know, in a typical year, we would see 400,000 hospitalizations from COVID. We'd see between 25 and 60,000 deaths, including 200 pediatric deaths. Yeah. This year, we don't even have a flu season. They're not even calling it a flu season. Mm -mm. We're only seeing one pediatric death. We're only seeing a few thousand hospitalizations. And people are going to say, you need to wear a mask for all the other reasons. And then the counter to that is we have decades of data showing that masks alone are not able to prevent the spread of influenza. And it was really the social distancing and the keeping schools closed because that's such a primary driver of influenza. And so the real argument is going to be, is the horrible effect of what we've done to our kids by not allowing them to socialize going to be worth you know, maintaining to prevent influenza from spreading? And I just don't think that we have the will to do that, nor do I think that's necessarily the right thing to do. Yeah. The yeah. other thing that I'm asked about is what's next? What's going to be the thing that worries you? And the, the concern is that we've now spent a year where no one's been exposed to influenza. And the yeah. immune system may have uh, faded a little bit for immunity to influenza. And if you get the wrong uh, reassortment of, of, of genes, you know, the influenza has a segmented genome. If those segments rearrange in a way that's unlucky, we could have another problem. And I think you're going to see <laughs> a lot of discussion about influenza next year, especially if the influenza vaccine turns out not to be particularly good. You know, the COVID vaccines are so outstandingly uh, effective. Yeah that if we come out with an influenza vaccine that's 42% effective, are people gonna get yeah. it? You know, so that, that's what, what concerns me. Right. Well, to that, you know, to that point, right, are we going to be able to, you know, let, let's, let's, let's project here, right? So when, when we start to see these new and emerging flu strains, you know, how far in front of the ball do you think we can get? You know, do you think we will actually be able to say, you know, yeah, we think this is, you know, mutated and rearranged in a problematic way. These are the actual strains that we're seeing. Do you think we have the actual capacity to get in front of the influenza ball if it actually mutates in a way that's going to be, you know, really detrimental? I think we do. Uh, what I'm expecting is a couple of years from now, maybe this year, maybe a couple of, it's going to be a report of a new strain of influenza coming out of Russia or um, Afghanistan or somewhere, it's going to yeah. say, you know, this is H8N11, something new. 
and mm -hmm. watch it for a little bit and be kind of, you know, wary. And then if we see that it has person to person transmission, that's the key is, you know, there's lots of different viruses that can pop up and, you know, affect a few people, but it's the person to person trans. Yeah. If we can confirm that, then you're going to have a whole network of people who are ready to jump into, to, you know, address this appropriately. So I do think we're going to be, be pretty well prepared the next time around. And then we yep. just actually had a question that popped in. Um, do you see um, mRNA vaccines uh, potentially for flu as well? I mean, the mRNA vaccines have we've known about for decades and they haven't worked. And then suddenly they, they've worked. And this has opened up a whole new avenue of both uh, for prophylaxis, so for vaccines, but also therapeutics. So I, I would not rule out any use of mRNA right now for vaccines. Uh, yeah. This is yep. going to, especially considering how uh, wobbly our, our um, flu vaccines are and the fact that they're relatively porous. So um, I have not had any conversations yet with anyone who wants to study that, but I would certainly be open to it. I think it's, it's certainly possible. Well, and we're also, I mean, we're also trying to predict what, 18 months out, which strains of flu are going to be prevalent so that you can have production. But I think we've seen if the if the will is there, we can increase production capacity. Yeah, and the, the mRNA vaccines are good because you can just create a strip of genetic material yep. to tweak it if, if there's a new strain. So it's a very appealing yep. platform. Yeah. Yeah, and you can even I, I don't I don't know how scientifically valid this is, but if you think about the uh, the the structure of the flu virus and the stem versus the head, the head is really the thing that mutates. Can you actually now really just do something that targets the stem and maybe get around that? Yeah. So I think one of the big things that you've kind of targeted is you know this September and and getting back to school, and you know do we if we think about it, what, sh what should going back to school look like, right? And not for, you know, we can think about things in, you know, in either disadvantaged areas or anything like that, where it's going to be super incredibly important for kids to actually get back to that day-to-day -day experience. You know, how can we be smarter about thinking about how our kids go back to school and really to kind of keep things safe and, and do the best that we can in terms of, of mitigating things? It's, it's, it almost sounds like an unanswerable question, but what's your well, best guess here? Well, I, I consult for some New York City schools and help them reopen. And the first thing that we talked about was improving ventilation. And some mm -hmm. of these schools are just so outdated and old that it's not easy for them to do that. You know, there's data showing yeah. that, that for young kids, three feet of separation is just as good as six feet. And, you know, yeah. that was the other issue is just the space constraints. I think that you know we're going to see um, an authorization for emergency use of Pfizer's vaccine for kids age 12 to 15 over the summer, mm -hmm. and so a lot of the middle school and, and high school age yeah. kids will, will be vaccinated. But for you know elementary school, grade school kids, they're going to be wearing masks this fall. I, I don't see any way around that when when you've yeah. got the virus still you know spreading around, unless you can get to some extraordinarily low level of cases. But you know I just. I, I'm skeptical that that's going to happen based on what we've seen right now is that when I look at the, the headlines today, it's, you know, 50% of adults have, have gotten the COVID vaccine. Yeah. But the, the, the downside to that is that only 14% of adults still intend to get the vaccine who haven't yet. We're, we're going to be switching right. from a so supply issue to a demand issue. And yep. so that's going yep. to allow the virus to just circulate and perpetuate. And that's going to put our kids at, you know, at being potentially, yeah. you know, vectors for this as well. So I think that yeah. the challenge for schools is often they don't have the resources to improve the ventilation. Uh, I do not do any of the COVID theater stuff of, of um, worrying about inanimate objects. You know, I was, I never, uh, when I was riding the subway to work at the peak of the, of the pandemic, I wasn't worried about the handle that, or the seat. I was worried about the person yeah. coughing at the end. Yeah. And so I think that we don't need to worry about deep cleaning classrooms. It's, it's really just figuring out improving ventilation and, and trying to instill some confidence by getting the cases down low enough. But that, that may be elusive. I think that, you know, yeah. one thing that we've seen is, um, well, one is where, where we live. Our buildings, with the exception of one of our school buildings in the whole district, are all over 100 and say uh, over 100 years old. So they have no central air. They have no... So that's been a struggle is figuring out how how to actually ventilate the rooms 
And I, I will say, um, I know you have young kids and I have a fourth grader, like he often forgets to take off his mask, right? So <laughs> <Same. they're, laughs> we'll be driving along after and I'll be like, Harris, oh, Harris, you still have your mask on. You can take it off. Yeah, so I tell my kid to take his mask off all the time. <laughs> I know. So I think at least if the, particularly the elementary kids, you know, I, I think they've gotten used to it. And so they, while not ideal, I think they're probably in some ways more adaptable than we are to yeah. wearing it for long periods of time. Yeah, no, I yeah. agree. Um, and, and I think I, I'm optimistic that they're going to bounce back from this. Probably, yeah. hopefully better than, than we do. Um, I yeah. want to just address, see if there's any other questions in the, um, in the chat here. Is there anything you want me to tackle here? The, um, the question, there's a question about the duration of the immune response. Um, yeah. Short answer is we don't know. Uh, the, you know. There are four other coronaviruses that circulate in the world. And typically when you get one of those, you're immune for a couple of years. Mm -hmm. So there was reason to think that we would have immunity from, from this coronavirus for a while. The, the variants throw in a, a, a wrinkle to that. And so we yeah. don't yet know. Um, I have seen patients who are fully vaccinated who are developing COVID, who are developing mild symptoms from COVID. So these vaccines mm -hmm. are not airtight, but they're, you know, they're very good. Um, and we're now studying whether or not a specifically uh, a vaccine tailored to cover the variants um, is necessary as a booster shot in, in the fall. Um, I'm, I'm sure the companies want us to, to get that third shot. Um, I don't know that they're necessary. You know, we break variants down into three different groups. There's variants of interest, variants of concern, and then variants of high consequence. Yeah. High consequence is the one you worry about. Those are ones that yeah. evade our therapeutics, our diagnostics, and our vaccines. There are no variants of high consequence yet. Um, our vaccines are working against the variants right now um, as a general principle. So this is something we just are keeping a close eye on. And when we see a patient who gets admitted to the hospital with COVID, after vaccination, we sequenced that gene, uh, that, that, right. that virus to see if it was one of the variants and if so, how this is sort of affecting our, our vaccine use. So I think more to come on that, but I do expect to see these vaccines lasting for more than six months of protection. Um, I'm hopeful there'll be more than a year. Matt, what do you say for those of those in the audience today who run you know, companies and particularly in Manhattan, their offices are there, when should they start talking about bringing their, their staff back into the office? Well, the, the big thing that I've told people is that, that um, you want to have everyone who, to have had an opportunity to be vaccinated. Yeah. I, you know, I didn't, don't like the idea of mandating a vaccine that does not have FDA approval. Remember, these are, vaccines have emergency authorization, which means that the benefits likely outweigh the risks. But we don't have long-term safety data to, to give full approval. Yeah. Um, so... You know, and one company I work with uh, wanted everyone back in their Manhattan office in late March. And I said, you know, just because you got vaccinated doesn't mean everyone else has. And so, right. you know, we're, we're getting closer to so the, the, the time frame that I said to people is if you want to be uh, sure that everyone has had an opportunity to be fully vaccinated, then June 1st is a nice time, you know, after Memorial Day. Yeah. Um, and, and then because I think also the cases are going to be lower over the summer. And you're going to have, a, you don't want to be pushing people back in when the cases are surging, you know, and especially if you're in the New York City area or New York in general, cases are now really declining. Um, yeah. My hospital is seeing a consistent decline. The hospitalizations are dropping the you know, percent positives. Every indicator is going in the right direction. And this is mm -hmm. largely because I think of just the seasonality of this and people being able to spend more time outside. So June 1st is, you know, I think a, a good time. And then for people who are a little more conservative, I say give people the summer off and then think of, you know, after Labor Day coming back. Yep. So something, something that basically dovetails with kids hopefully going back to school exactly. and, and that, yeah. <laughs> yes. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, and, um, this has been fantastic. Thank you so much um, for joining us today. And for our audience, we'll obviously continue to have conversations about going back to the office, what that looks like. And then I, on May 4th, we're going to have a webinar talking about COVID therapeutics specifically um, with guests from some of the pharma companies that have developed and the biotech companies that have developed therapeutics. So. Well, thank you Matt, for having thank me. Thank you. Very
Thank you very much for joining us. This, this was great. And, you know, don't take this the wrong way, but I really, really hope that we don't have to do this again a year from now. I, I don't oh, want God. you to come back and look back on, on two years again. I want to talk, you know, when you come back a year from now, we can talk about your baseball book. Yeah, right? something else. That, <laughs> Thank that you. sounds much better. Thanks, Matt. Thank you. Thanks. Bye-bye. Have a great day, everybody. Thank you for tuning in to New York Bio's virtual breakfast series. Join us every Tuesday at 9 a.m. for more discussions with leaders from across the healthcare spectrum. For more information on New York Bio, please visit us at www.newyorkbio.org.